the things that we do know is when by the master's hand, a lot of changes take place in your life. And the first one among the first that happened is for us to say what Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So the words of this song are our testimony for everyone who has trusted Christ as their savior. Here I am, Lord. you remain standing with your Bibles open to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 and while you are locating your scripture I just want to commend you on your enthusiasm in your singing. I was in a conversation with the Bill before the service and telling him, commenting him about this being a singing church, you being singing people. And before I came to this church as pastor, I went to other churches that 
didn't have pastors and some that wish they didn't. And, but uh, some of those were very small congregations. And when I say small, I'm talking about 20 people. And I will tell you, 20 people can, who can sing can do okay. 20 people who can't sing, it's not good. And I'm no help to them. And it's just uh, like, will we ever get through this song? So I enjoy when you sing from your heart. It's one of those that we just wish the song would go on and on. I know you don't feel that way about the sermon, but nonetheless, I uh, just rejoice in singing. We do rejoice in God's Word, and that Word this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, reading verses 42 through 45, and we'll be making reference to other parts of this chapter. This is God's Word. Jesus called them to Him and said unto them, You know that they which are accounted to the rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. For whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. And our key verse, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Father, thank you for teaching us a new and better way. Thank you for teaching us what the servant's heart, what the servant's spirit is really like. Thank you for calling us to follow your example and to know that we could never set ourselves above the Lord. Thank you, Father, today for giving us the honor and the privilege of serving in your great harvest field. You have clearly said the harvest is great and the laborers are few. You're still calling out people to serve. So we pray this morning that your spirit will do precisely that. Touch the heart, speak to the hearts of each one, everyone, to be sure that our life is aligned with the service of our Lord. And help us to remember, Father, that it is our responsibility. It's our greater than, more than that. It is our privilege. It is no sacrifice to serve the Lord only in honor. So thank you today that we're privileged to do that. In this hour, we pray for those who don't know Christ as their Savior that the Spirit of the Lord will speak to them. We know He'll do that. Our prayer would be that that person will respond in saving faith and give their heart to the Lord, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you would, and it is our joy to welcome you. It's our honor to welcome you this morning as we come to worship. Uh, this is the season of the year that we've said you can just see the handiwork of God everywhere. It's a special time of the year, and we are privileged to be in the Lord's house this week to worship together with people of like faith. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we greet you in Jesus' name and to know that His Spirit is everywhere. And we do know that His Spirit is present here. And we pray that you will sense that because whatever we do, the songs, the scripture, the sermon, no matter, it's all about how the Spirit of God works through that uh, to bless each of us, to encourage each of us. I will tell you, perhaps I've said this before, but on any given Sunday in the afternoons, reflecting on the service here, it's always a part of me that wonders, is there something else I could have done? Is there something else the church could have done? Could we have made the worship service more meaningful? We trust the Lord and we follow His guidance and we pray that God looks beyond and beneath the things that we say and do and He knows our heart. 
and we lift our hearts in praise and adoration to the Lord. For those who are joining us by Facebook or YouTube, thank you for being our extended family. And uh, please know that you are part of the family of this church, and we really pray that you are part of the family of God. Amen. And so if not, uh, you've got business right now, this morning, with the Lord. Uh, you need to take care of this matter because there's nothing that facing you right now that's more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. We trust that you will keep in prayer the announcements that are in your bulletin. You've heard me say this a number of times. I don't read announcements. Uh, I think, first of all, it's an insult to you to think that I've got to read them for you. And uh, second of all, uh, to know that uh, there are things there that uh, you just need to make a matter of prayer. They're not all about participation. They are things about prayer. Uh, you keep this as a matter of prayer, and we just ask you one note. If you have uh, request for financial considerations in the New Year's budget, you need to get that to a member of the budget committee. And may ask the members of the budget committee if you'd raise your hand so you'll know, okay, here we are. So these are the people you need to see if you want your money. And so, uh, but it is important. And we just, again, ask you to make that a matter of prayer. Speaking of prayers, uh, the sanctuary choir this morning sings us a song about exactly that. So, if you would, tell us. It's all about the people. Hazel was telling me a moment ago that in November it'd be 50 years since I performed the marriage ceremony for Hazel and Jean. And uh, it's interesting because I guess you were the first marriage ceremony I performed. I don't think you were ordained at that point. I think you had to get special permission yeah. to do it. So, so <laughs> anyhow, I know this. You weren't as scared as I was. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you're still here and I'm still here, so something to be said for that. So I just say God bless you and thanks to Paul and Renee for their assistance, uh, not just to me, but to you. Many people don't know. Uh, Many people don't know what Paul and Renee do as far as ministering to the church, and that's okay. And many things that he does, I don't know, and that's okay, and I don't need to. 
but we talk together, we share together, and and uh, we worship together, we serve together. And that's the Lord's calling, and I just say God bless him for what they've done, and thank you so much, uh, Renee, for being the support, and you too. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for, I say before, and I've said again, she spends half her time waiting on me and the other half waiting for me. So, yes. but it all works out pretty good. So, God bless you. Thank you so much for the, this yes. fellowship that is such a blessing to be a part of it and such an honor to be your pastor. Wouldn't you say that, Paul? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Okay, you can
Thank you, Sanctuary Choir, for reaching the peak this morning in the message you, you have shared. Just so you'll not forget, and you probably won't, next Sunday we set the clock back. And so you shouldn't have any problems sleeping an hour longer. Uh, it's usually when we set the clock forward that we get into trouble. But just keep in that in mind and pass that word on to uh, those who may not remember that. The only thing that would happen if you forget is you'll be here on time. Make no mistake about it, you will. God forbid that I should say anything at the outset or anywhere in the sermon today about a campaign. Uh, I just say, God, give us grace for one more week that we get through this election and get past all of the mudslinging, and you do not want to listen to the news this week, I can tell you that, because every break they have, uh, somebody's going to be throwing mud back and forth at one another. But there was some campaigning that going on in the scripture this morning, and it was James and John. Uh, this was the beginning, it's the heart of what we're sharing with you today. The two of them were campaigning for the chief seats, in the kingdom. They only asked that one of us be seated on the right hand and the other on the left hand. Nothing presumptuous about them, was it? And uh, we do know that on another occasion, they got their mother involved in this. And this is about as ugly as it gets. And the scripture also says, and you would expect this, that the other 10 really took issue, took exception to them having the gall to ask the Lord about that. And uh, the Lord never made any response to them about what they were going to do. He put it back on them. He said, you have to understand, in my kingdom, we don't work like that. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be the lowest in the service to man. And not low in terms of what the quality of what you're doing, but you've got to have a servant's heart. And then he made this statement. And it to me, it is one of the most precious verses in all of the Bible. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. And don't miss that word, even, but even the Son of Man. And I believe the Lord would have in mind that the one who was entitled to be ministered unto didn't ask for it. Jesus Christ could have had 10,000. He could have had a million. He could have had 10 million angels who would have done his bidding. And he never asked for that. Even the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto. To the contrary, he could have said that and left it at that. But he didn't. To the contrary... He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And one of the things we're going to find out, if you haven't already learned this, is that if you want to be in service, you're going to have to learn the meaning of the word sacrifice. There is no sacrifice, there's no service unless and until you're willing to give up something. And he made it abundantly clear. You want to be my followers, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. Understand today that I want the best for this church. I hope you know that by now. I pray you do. If you don't, it probably won't be any good for me to tell you. But I want the best for this church. And how do I measure what's best for this church? Simply this. What's going to stand up at the judgment seat of Christ? I want to tell you, I can comment and compliment you on a lot of things. You are a loving fellowship. You are in one accord, just as the early church was. The spirit of love between you is unequal. It really is. It's very unique. And not only that, but you are faithful in stewardship. I don't know who gives what financially. I've never known, I've never wanted to know. There's only one person who does know, 
and that's the church secretary, who is also the financial secretary. But I know what the bottom line is. I know what the church is doing in the way of stewardship. And as many of you have learned, I'm very reluctant to preach a sermon on anything to do with money. Because I believe if you've got problems with money, you've got bigger problems, and you need to address those. You are very faithful in your attendance, some more than others. I know your pattern. I know some are going to be here every Sunday, and if they're not, it's because they're providentially hindered from being here. I know some will be here two Sundays out of four. And the reason I know that is because you are very, very consistent in where you're sitting. And so when you're not here, your absence is very conspicuous, I have to tell you. And so it's not difficult for me to do a mental photo of the congregation every morning and not every Sunday and know who's not here. But I'm telling you, I don't know that the Lord is going to give awards at the judgment seat of Christ for attendance. Growing up in our home church, as other churches did, they gave pins for perfect attendance. Our father had like 15, 17, or 20. And I know there were some who had more than he did. And that was commendable to think that somebody went 15 to 20 years and never missed a Sunday. I think they did allow you two Sundays. But never missed a Sunday in Sunday school. It's quite commendable. But I don't know how impressed the Lord is with that. Obviously, it's a statement of love and consistency, no doubt about it. But what we are going to be judged for is how we have used the talent God gave us to use. And make no mistake about it, He has given each one of us something that we can do. He has gifted us. He has given us a talent. As the Scripture says, the one who got five, the one who got three, and the other who got one. The one who got five invested his, the one who got three invested his, and the one who got one buried his. And when the judgment day showed up, he had nothing to show for what the Lord had given to him. I want to tell you today that you can only find so much fulfillment in your relationship to Christ until you have made the commitment to be in service, to do what you can do for the Lord. Attendance is fine. God bless you. And I hope that you will make that commitment to be here unless you are providentially hindered. But I'm also going to tell you there's a part that God wants for you. There's things that God wants for you that you'll never realize until you put your hand to the plow until you find your place in service, until you say, here am I, Lord, send me. You recall a few years ago when churches were having the Purpose Driven Life seminars, when Rick Warren came out with the Purpose Driven Church, and it seems like every church was getting on board. Rick Warren said this, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It is far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose, and for his purpose. Simply put, unless and until you have a personal and living encounter with the Lord and find your place in service, make no mistake about it, you're not going to get the maximum out of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know why the Dead Sea got its name? Of course you do. The Dead Sea takes in all of the fresh water from the Jordan River. The problem is, it has no outlet. It's there, it grows stale, it's stagnant. And it is the same way with the Christian life. You cannot continue to take in the blessings of God. You cannot take in the goodness of God and day after day and week after week 
and not have some way of being a blessing. When you receive a blessing, you become a blessing. And what comes in goes out. And unless until it does, something is going to be sort sadly and sorely missing in your life. Last week we talked about Titus and his grief down in the book down in the town of Crete, in the city of Crete. And it's interesting when you read through the book of Titus, all the three chapters, how many times the apostle Paul says to Titus, good works, good works, good works, good deeds, good deeds, good deeds. In other words, Titus, the best way to deal with the problems at the church in Crete is to give people something to do. Because unless they have, are occupied with the things of Christ, they're going to be preoccupied with the things of Satan. Make no mistake about it. And so, you say, well, Pastor, I don't know where to start. Well, I'll tell you where to start. First of all, you begin with a willing heart. You just have to be willing to say and mean it. Lord, here am I. What do you want me to do? Do you not realize, of course you do, do you not recall that the first question the Apostle Paul asked the Lord when they had that encounter on the Damascus Road was, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that's the first question that any of us are going to have to ask if we expect to find any degree, any measure of fulfillment in our life. In other words, when you have a willing hand, heart, you're not going to be very far from having working hands because God will show you something. God will open a door. He will lay a burden on your heart. And as Dr. Charles Stanley said, if God puts a burden on your heart, that means he's going to do something about it, and that means he probably wants you involved in what he's going to do about it. And so I want to tell you today, as we get into this season of the year, and you say, Pastor, this is a poor time to be asking people about doing anything more they're doing. I'm not asking you to do more than you're doing. I'm asking you to do what the Lord wants you to do. There's a song. I'm not, first of all, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Christmas carol songs. I'm certainly not Christmas carols. But there is one that I sing throughout the year. You don't want to hear it, but I, yeah, and I don't sing the whole song. Oh, by the way, you're going to love this. You are just going to love this. I've got to put this in here. This week in a department store, I saw something that has absolutely taken the chart. It's taken the trophy, no doubt about it. It is a handle, a roller for toilet paper tissue. And when you roll off the toilet paper, it plays Christmas songs. <laughs> Can you believe that? Do you believe that? Just what we need to see some kid get fascinated with that roll and just keep pulling it off until, <laughs> so the thing will keep playing. I just tell you, I think that's one idea that needs to be flushed. Anyhow, we'll get to that, to that later on. But the song that I keep thinking, the keep song that I keep singing throughout the year is this. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I look at things, I walk in, I walk out, and I see things that need to be done. And does anybody else see that? Listen, you want to know, make no mistake about it. And so with that in mind, this is what I have decided to do about it. This is what I have decided how to resolve that problem. We're going to start a new church. I'm going to start a new church. Pastor, where are you going to start it? Right here. Well, when are you going to start it? Right now? This morning? Well, I want to be a member when I talk about membership. When I talk about membership. We'll talk about ministry. And so I want you to know that you say, all right, sign me up. Well, first of all, let me know what I've got to do. No, it's not going to work that way. It doesn't work that way. The Lord doesn't work that way. You make sure that you are willing to be drafted into the king's business, into the king's army. This past week or two, I saw something go across TV that apparently there is a super basketball player out there to be drafted. He is seven feet, four inches tall. Needless to say, every team is licking their chops at the possibility of drafting him. 
And make no mistake about it, the league is on to it. And what they're watching for is for the teams to tank. In other words, they will intentionally lose so they will have the worst record and therefore they'll get the first draft choice. But I want you to know God doesn't look for the number one draft choice. To the contrary, God deliberately bypasses the number one draft choice. He absolutely does. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the call. And this morning, he is looking for somebody who wants to be a part of his team, a part of his army, a part of his family, a part of his fellowship. And so I've just decided that on the basis of the scripture, I know who I want. And I hope you will be in agreement with you. But first of all, I'm going to tell you who I don't want. I don't want Demas. The scripture says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. The apostle Paul couldn't count on him. He gave up on him. I don't want Demas. I don't want Diotrephes. He's done. He's out. I don't want him. Diotrephes loved the preeminence. Diotrephes always wanted to be number one. He has just always wanted to be at the head of the line. He always wanted to have the recognition. I don't want that. I don't want Balaam. Balaam wanted to know the will of God, but he didn't want to do it. I want somebody who wants to know the will of God and is willing to follow through and make it a reality. Because I'm telling you, if you're waiting for God to give you a buffet list and to say, pick and choose what you want, leave the rest. That's not going to happen. And so I'll tell you who I do want. First of all, I want Dorcas. The scripture says that Dorcas was a good woman. I read that and I thought, couldn't you do any more than that? Couldn't you do any better than that? But Dorcas, when you say that, you have said it all. You have said a lot. Because this was a woman who was just inherently good. She was just somebody who you would want to have as your neighbor. You would want to have her in your family. You definitely would want to have her in the church. By the way, we have a lot of Dorcas in this church. We really do. We have a lot of women, just good women. And you're just good people. You really are. I also want to have in the scripture, I want to have the woman in chapter 7 of the Gospel of Luke, verses 36 and following. And we aren't told who this lady was. We're just told she was a sinner. But I'll take her. Because in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, we find her coming to the feet of Jesus. She has an alabaster box of ointment. She pours that ointment out on the feet of Jesus. She weeps over the feet of Jesus, even as she is pouring out the ointment. And then she proceeds to wipe the feet of Jesus with her hair. And if that isn't enough, she kissed the feet of of our blessed Lord. Wouldn't you know, there's some old selfish creature who rose up and say, oh, what a waste. This could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And the Lord came back and said, you know what? Since I came into this house, you haven't done one thing. <laughs> you haven't done one thing to show me any love. She has poured out this ointment. She has wiped my feet with the hair of her head and then she proceeded to kiss my feet. I want to tell you who she reminds me of. I've told this story before, but I can't get it away from me. I live by this, so this story. The largest church in the world today is in South Korea. They have seven services on Sunday to accommodate the crowd. They have a 10-year waiting list of people who want to teach the Scriptures. Now, somebody doesn't teach for life. They rotate, and that church has a 10-year waiting list of people who want to teach. The church almost wasn't built. They had a prayer time on a Friday night. 
the church has a mountain. The people went up into the mountain to pray. And Saturday is a work day, so they pray all night on Friday night. They work on Saturday. But then they had a service, seeing what they could do to make this church a reality. It didn't look like it was going anywhere until an old lady, and I'm not being disrespectful, I'm speaking of this as an old man, an old lady came forward and gave her rice bowl and two chopsticks, and she said to the pastor, I want you to sell these, and whatever they bring, give it to the church. And he said, you cannot do that. You can't sell your rice bowl and chopsticks. And she said, I'm an old woman, and I can eat my rice with my fingers, and I can eat them off of newspaper or whatever I need. But I must not go and meet my Lord and never having given him anything of this world's goods. And so the largest church in the world today is there because an old lady gave her rice bowl and two chopsticks. And so when we are inclined to say, I don't have anything to do, I don't have anything to give, think again, make no mistake about it. I want Bartimaeus in my church. Make no mistake about it. I want Bartimaeus in this church. Barnabas was a man who in Mark chapter 10 and verse 46, you recall the heated argument that Paul and Barnabas, this is not Barnabas, this is Barnabas, I beg your pardon, it's Acts 15 verse 39. Paul and Barnabas had a heated argument, and I do mean it was a heated argument, because Paul wanted to take, John, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him. And Paul said, nothing to it. He got homesick one time, <laughs> he quit, and I'm not taking him with me anymore. And so the scripture says that Barnabas chose John Mark. If we had not had an encourager like Barnabas, we would not have the gospel of Mark. Because Barnabas was willing to give a man a second chance. We've got to have people who believe in people. We've got to have a people who believe in second chance. After all, there's not one among us today who are not here and not saved because our Lord believed he, he is the God of second chance. And he gave us that second chance. Not only that, I would take the thief on the cross, but he's not there. He's not available. He went to paradise the same day he invited Christ into his heart. But I can tell you, if he were here, I'd take it, no matter what. I don't, I'll tell you who I will take. I will take Barnabas. Scripture tells us that blind Barnabas one day heard Jesus coming by. And keep in mind, he can't see anything, but there's nothing wrong with his hearing. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 46, we are told that Barnabas heard Jesus coming and he cried out to Jesus <laughs> and the people said, hush up, be quiet. You don't want to be talking to the Lord like this. And I love what the scripture says. The more they told him to hush up, the louder he got. And he would not be denied, he would not be silenced. And the Lord said to somebody, Bring him over here to me. And guess what? Bartimaeus threw his night co cover away. And he threw his cloak away. You say, why would a blind man ever do away with his, with his coat, with his cloak? Simply this, because he knew when he got to Jesus, he was going to be able to see. And he, could be, he would be able to find it. And so the scripture says, the Lord asked him, what do you want me to do for you? What does any blind man want? But the Lord again wanted to hear it from him. And the scripture is very clear. The Lord healed him. And the scripture says, Barnabas followed Jesus on the way. I'm telling you this morning, Jesus Christ will give you anything 
that will make you a better follower of his. I will take the publican. Remember the story of the publican in Luke chapter 18 and verse 10? Remember the story of the publican and the Pharisee? The Pharisee who prayed, God, I want to thank you that I'm like other men. Well, I can tell you, other men were thanking God. They weren't like him either. And then the Lord talked about a publican who would not even lift his head, but prayed, dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Lord asked the question, which one of these two do you think went down to their house justified? I'm going to tell you about the publican. The publican was a man who was broken. And the one vessel that God cannot use is a dirty vessel. But the one vessel that he can use is a broken vessel. And the publican was a man who was broken before God. With that in mind, I want and I will take the prodigal. I'll take a man, I don't care what his background is, if he's come to know the Lord. And he said when he was coming up that road, rehearsing his speech, I'm going to say to my father, I am no more worthy to be called your son. I'll take that man. I'll take him. I want him in the church. I want the prodigal. I want the publican. I want the Barnabas, Barnabas. And not only that, there's two others that I want. I want David's mighty men. You will read about them in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 17. There's some debate about how many there were. But some say 50, some say 30, but I'm going to tell you about three out of the, however they were. David is being chased. This is one of those times when he's running for his life. And David says, I would love to have some of that water out of the well at Bethlehem. Three of those men broke through and got that water and brought it back to David. Then he did something, I keep thinking, surely you didn't do that. The scripture cannot be right, but I know it is. David poured it out. He said, if somebody is willing to risk their life for me, I can't drink this water. I'm looking for people who are willing to make a sacrifice. You've got to make a sacrifice. Does not the scripture say, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and then what? And to give his life. You can't have service without sacrifice. I'll give you this story for a moment. I said something to you last week about me walking. And uh, it's been a few weeks since we had any rain, so it's been a few weeks since this happened. But I'm walking up the road, and it's one of those days where the showers are off and on. They're not consistent, but they're off and on. And so I think it's a break, and I'll, I'll take off up the road. And uh, somebody stopped to talk to me. I'm never good with that. First of all, because it breaks your stride. Second of all, I sweat. Oh, I sweat all the time. My shirt will be wet by the time I get out of here today. And, but nonetheless, I don't like to stop because I get chilled. Now, nonetheless, they stop and they want to talk, and that's okay for a few minutes. Well, it wasn't that long. And the next thing you know, the sky's open. It started to rain. And I said, I've got to get going. It's shining along pretty good. And they said, and get this, they're riding in a vehicle. And they said, yeah, we got to be going too. And they wound that window up and off they went. Oh, dear God, with friends like that, I'll tell you what, you, you don't make your sacrifice. I guess they thought, you know, I'm not going to have any soaking wet preaching in my vehicle, no matter what. Let me tell you, if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to have to learn the meaning of the word sacrifice. You're going to have to learn to do things when it is inconvenient, well, it's something you may not particularly want to do, then I want to tell you, the one that I want is Gideon's 300 men. You know the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7? When Gideon is fighting or about to fight the Midianites, and he is saying, God, they are as plentiful as the stars in the sky. It's too many of them. I have only have 32,000 men. What am I going to do? And the scripture says that God said to Gideon, you tell anybody who doesn't want to fight, you tell anybody who's scared to get over there. 
they don't tip the, step to the side. 22,000 men chickened out. 22,000 men stepped to the side. So he's now got 10,000 men against an army that you cannot number. And God says, we're still too many. So I'll tell you again what you want you to do. You go down to the creek, and anybody who gets down on all fours and drinks from the water, you put them to the one side. You have now got 10,000 people left. You tell anybody who cups the water in their hand and drinks it to get over to the other side. 300 men cup the water in their hands. Why was that important? Because you never turn your back on the enemy. Make no mistake about it. You've got to watch that while you are drinking. I have one thing I've learned through watching Westerns is that you never get down on all four and drink from a creek just as sure as you do. Mark it down. It's not going to be a good ending. It's not going to be a good ending. And so this morning, I'm asking you, what in his world are you doing? What in the Lord's world, what in the Lord's kingdom are you doing? I'm telling you, you one day you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm just trying to prepare us all for that moment. And I don't want it to be a time of embarrassment. I don't want you to tell the Lord, I buried my talent. I didn't gain anything, but I didn't lose anything either. It didn't happen. It should not happen. And close with this. I'll close with this. Dr. Charles Stanley says, the best advice in the Bible is given in the Gospel of John, chapter 2 and verse 5. Remember the story when they ran out of wine at the wedding feast? And remember when the mother of Jesus came to the Lord and said, they don't have any wine. And he said, What's I got, what have I got to do with that? And then she told her servants this. And this is why we all need to take the best advice in the Bible. She said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. The best advice. And so if you want to know about serving in the kingdom, if you want to know about serving and sacrifice, all I can tell you is you sign up today. I don't know what the Lord wants you to do. I don't know. But I'm telling you, if you've got a willing heart, it will not be long before you'll have working hands. God will show you somewhere to go. He will show you what to do. It may be from your home. It may be a card ministry. I don't know what it is. It may be something here in the church. Now, Pastor, I thought we had a committee to do that. Let me tell you, for God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. He's sending individuals. He's anointing individuals. And he's given each of us a place of service. And again, it is no sacrifice to serve the Lord, only an honor. But I'm telling you today, the willing spirit comes first. The willing heart has to be there first. And when that happens, the Lord will open a door. The Lord will open a door. I could probably offer suggestions to you but I much prefer for it to come from the Lord. But I'm telling you, nothing's going to happen until you take the first stand. And so I ask you again, what in his world are you doing? It's a time of soul searching. It's a time of just getting alone with the Lord and talking about what can I do? What can I do? Don't make excuses. God makes exceptions. And so I'm asking you today, what in his world are you doing? Would our worship leaders come and I share this invitation with you? And that invitation hymn this morning is at the cross.
beautiful song. This is God's word for us today. This is the invitation. I don't know if anybody has brought this to your attention or not, but tomorrow is Independence Day. Pastor, you need to go back and look at the calendar. It's November. It's October, not July. I know it is. But tomorrow is Independence Day for believers. And I'll tell you why that's true. In October, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther went down to the University of Wittenberg and nailed on the door of the university his theses. 95 reasons why he did not agree with the teachings of the Pope. And among those reasons was one, he said, I don't believe that I have to climb up steps on my knees to do penance. I don't think I have to do that. He was talking about being forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but he said, I don't believe that I have to confess my sin to somebody else who is just as sinful as I am. Needless to say, <laughs> that didn't go over well either. That didn't become very popular. Martin Luther was told, you have declared war on the Pope. And Martin Luther said, if this war is between the Pope and me, I'm finished, I'm done. If it's between the Pope and the God that I serve, he's done. And so on October 31st, 1517, what does that come out to, 700 years or something like that? 700 years ago, we have our Declaration of Independence. We have our freedom because on that day, we had an understanding that we can all approach the throne of grace. We can, the scripture says, come boldly. We don't come arrogantly, but we come boldly. The door is open. Jesus Christ is there to invite us to come and pray. Come and talk to the Father. Come and talk to the Lord. And so today, I want you to know the way has been opened. The door has been opened. Jesus Christ opened it because at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. God never liked anything that separates. And he did not waste any time doing away with everything that keeps people from coming into a fellowship with Jesus Christ. And the reason we can do that is because of the old rugged cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. This is why we have freedom of religion, freedom of Christianity today. Not because so much of Martin Luther, although he was the one who opened that door, but because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. And by the way, you'll never know freedom like you know it when you give your heart to Jesus Christ and just say, here am I, Lord, here am I. Would you stand? Would you sing?
Father, we take these words to heart. Here, Lord, I give myself away. This all that I can do. Thank you, Father, today for the privilege of serving the Lord. For it is no sacrifice, only an honor to serve the Lord. And we praise you that you've given us that opportunity. May we seize it from the depth of our heart and ask ourselves, better yet, allow the Spirit of the Lord to search us and ask us question, what in his world are we doing in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. As we're dismissed, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Amen. Amen.